disturbance. By correlating them, you're removing disturbance. But I hate correlating residuals. That's evil. So get rid of the duplicate item and the model solves better. The model will improve. Items with attractions. I always look for items that want to be on six factors or three factors because that's clearly a bad item. It doesn't have simple structure. Items with large attraction to other items in their own factor, they're problematic. Maybe you want to think about getting rid of one of them. It's highly subjective. And what I tend to do is just go, okay, lots of them have little MI, but which items have the most MIs across the whole set? So I'll just use a rule of thumb of sum up all the MIs and go, oh, you guys are the problem. I need to think about how to fix you guys, whether it's remove them. And sometimes an MI will say, item 13 should be, is probably a candidate for removing, but if you only have three items in that factor, you're not going to do that. You're going to try and keep those three, even if number 13 wants to be sticky. Theory must drive your decision making, not just number chasing. This is a new one for me. What do you mean when you said uh, that uh, you can delete or change item? What do you mean change item? You can check, it'll give you a recommendation of what path to add, whether it's a correlation path or a regression path. That's what the MI is going to tell you. It, it'll say, if you add this extra path, whether it's a covariance or a regression, you will get this much improvement in fit. But you will also get a decrease in interpretability and meaningfulness. And that's the price you don't want to pay. Yes, I want a good fitting model, but still makes sense. So this is something I learned in preparing this week's lectures. Uh, as far as I know, uh, no, Amos does provide this as well, the expected parameter change. It indicates the estimated value of a fixed parameter if it were added to the model. A direct estimate of the size of the misspecification for the restricted parameters. Parameters associated with large EPC values indicate the most model misspecification. It's saying, you should have put this in there, you stupid because it'll really improve your fit. The standardized EPC is the better one to use. Don't use the raw one, use the standardized one. It's invariant to the rescaling, and it's uh, for residual covariances, are standardized using their respective, so it's all very nice. And what do you look for? Just people. No, no, it's another 20 minutes. Good. Because I'm not 50. Items that have strong indicators are candidates. They're not, you must, they're candidates. They're people you inspect and evaluate. Items you think about, hmm, if I did that, what would it mean to the meaning? If I didn't do this, what does it mean? Items that are highly attractive, factors that want to be joined. Remember, it's always, it, we're not just following the statistics, we're actually thinking about the meaning. So, here's an example where I had, before I took away the three items, my fit was below desirable, but I took away these three items, and this change reduced the degrees of freedom from 474 to 384, so that's 90 degrees of freedom drop, which contributes to why this gamma hat starts to be in the acceptable range. But did it mean the same? By losing those three items, you know, like, what have I changed? You can't just be superficial about this. you really got to think about it. Jamobi, yay, here's our friend in Jamobi. The default display of Jamobi when you ask for modification indices is greater than 10. 
I always change it to greater than 20 because I honestly don't think any, I've never seen anything below 20 that when you do it makes very much difference to the fit. It won't make enough difference. So I like to ignore the small stuff and concentrate on the big stuff. So here is a Jamovi modification index output. These are the items. These are the factors. So it says, clearly there are no modification indices of CE items within CE. Duh. You're already there. So, And it says, if you add another path from CE5 to PE, you'll get a 13.89 improvement. Or to that one, 21. To this one, 44. Ooh, 44. 27, 21, 30. Okay. What do you mean? I want to add CE to all the other factors except SQ? What happened to simple structure? You know, like, oh, really? I'm not sure I want to do that. Because I'm in charge, not the machine. But when I look down the line, here's SQ1 and 2, 44, 44, 37, 37, 60, 60. These numbers are almost identical, too. And they're big. So there's something weird about SQ1 and 2. And that's the thing I need to think about much more than saying, oh, I'm just going to make SQ part of everything. Huh? We've already got the shared covariance with the factor level, so maybe these items are just... Uh, uh, CE, da 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 da. If you were worried about CE5, you could probably say, well, let's just throw CE5 out. After all, I have six items. I could afford to throw CE5 out, and I should be able to document what was the change in meaning by removing 5. Maybe 5 is redundant, and I can afford to lose 5. Right? So you should always be looking at the content effect, not just the stat effect. But I think before I did anything, I would spend some time thinking about these two SQ items as to why they're behaving so much the same way. And maybe, well, what if I just ran it seven factors without SQ? Would, how much change would that make? I, that might be something that I would start with. Is, but what if I take away the two problematic items that are in the same factor and did without them? Here's, what did I just do? That, that, what did I do? I don't know what I just did. Oh, this is showing all the little ones. You can see, no, no, that's exactly the same. I don't see any difference. Here's some the, the Levan approach, because the Jamovi doesn't give you the expected parameter change value. This is the syntax, the modification indices of this. So if that's my model and I want the modification indices. And so there's the command mod indices. This is my model. Sort. I want them sorted. You know, like and then only greater than 20, because I don't care about the little stuff, right? And then I copy and pasted it into Excel, because I can't. Maybe Dimitri can ma manipulate the output in R. I can't. So I copy and pasted it, and I sort it on MI, and I flashed <laughs> the big ones in red. And then I sorted for the CEPC, standardized EPC, all. And I flagged them in red, and then I resorted them, and so I can see that two things are really big on both metrics. So these are the two that I should really pay attention to. And what is it saying? Equal, this is a regression sign in Levan syntax. 
So it's saying that IG should load onto BB1. Okay, so it's saying that the IG factor wants bad and IG should have number one. Which makes me think, well, wait a minute, that violates simple structure. What if I just created a new factor, bad, that had all the IG and all the bad items? That might be more honest with the items that they all belong to one factor, rather than saying there's two factors and one item is in two factors. Right? So just because this diagnoses the problem doesn't mean I have to accept the solution. I'm the analyst and I have to be able to explain. Because of this, maybe I want to try, rerun it, as all IG and VD items are in one factor. That might be smarter. The second one says TI4, double tilde means, can you remember what double tilde means? Correlation. Sorry? No. Correlation. Yeah. TI4 wants to be correlated with TI5. And oh, no you don't. I'm not having that in my models. So that means I'm going to look at those two items, look at their loadings and go, which one do I like? Meeny, meeny, miny, mo. I like number four. Goodbye number five. Run it again. Because that putting that correlation in on the residual between TI4 and 5 will improve the fit by this much. And I just think that's an evil thing to do, so don't do it. So solve it in a different way. So just because it tells you to do it doesn't mean you need to do it. It tells you you need to solve the problem. Save it, run it, check it. Save it, run it, check it. Right? Clearly mark what you've done. And then you can see down here, all of these are regress bad onto IG1. Oh, wait a minute. IG and bad. Okay. So it's looking like the bad and IG items really want to be on both factors. Well, why not just make it one factor? CE3 and 6. Wait a minute. Correlate those damn residuals. PE1 and TI3. No, no, I don't care if you think this will make it better. I'm not doing it because they're in two different factors anyway. CE1 and PE2. No, no, I'm not doing that one. You don't have to do what it says. PE to TI3. Oh, come on. That's nonsense. PE to CE1. PE to CE2. Well, maybe the PE and the CE should be one factor. A simpler structure. Um, all the PEs and CEs are on one factor. Or you could go, well, I like the PE is separate, so maybe I make PE underneath CE. So the CE 1 to 6 plus CE explains PE. Maybe that works better. Right? It's always a judgment call. Don't just follow the instructions of the machine. Think about what the machine is trying to tell you and how else you could solve it without destroying your theoretical model. And then at some point, you're going to have to say, well, the fit is now acceptable. Yes, I could keep chasing these things, but Do I want a model that's 100% all variants explained? The only way to do that is have everything correlated with everything. And that's not simpler or more explainable. <coughs> Here's my message again repeated. What not to do? Do not correlate those residuals. Evil. Do not do it. Because the f it goes back to fundamentals of both classical test theory and factor analysis, the residuals are meant to be random in their patterns. Everything I can't explain is now systematically related to everything I can't explain, and I can't explain how or why? Come on. Grow up. Don't do this. Don't let yourself do it. Don't let your friends do it. Don't let review people do it in their articles that they send to you to review or comment on. But you know there are papers which prove the relation. I know. 
And there are textbooks. Barbara Byrne is one of the greatest offenders of this. Barbara Byrne's textbooks always show correlated residuals because they're very similar in meaning. If two things are that correlated, then one of them is redundant. Throw one away. Come on, we're not, we're not supposed to just follow blindly to maximizing fit. We're supposed to be thinking about what does it mean? And I cannot explain what a correlated residual is in this kind of situation. If you're going to correlate these two, why didn't you correlate that one with it? Why didn't you correlate these others? You didn't do it because it didn't improve fit. Come on. You can't have your cake and eat it. Just don't do it, please. Spare yourself embarrassment. Don't do it. Why does it say plausible in longitudinal studies, though? Ah, because you when I talk tomorrow about longitudinal, it is plausible because you're not talking about within time, you're talking about across time. Mm -hmm. How I answer, because how I did on my math test last week influences how I do on my math test next week. The past influences the present and the present influences the future. That's a different situation. Yes, please. If you can't get good fit except by doing this, your model is wrong. You need to troubleshoot that model by looking at other things and the first thing I would do is, really, which one of these do you like? Keep one. It's the simplest solution. Look, I've got enough. Keep one. Throw the other one away. So, so if you really don't have any ideas, then, okay, well, throw it in the air and see where they go. You know, like, that's really, I really haven't got a clue. It's really all... All of this manipulation in statistics is really not about letting the machine tell you what to do. It's in letting the machine advise you, inform you, so that you can make a decision based on your intelligence, your theory, your conceptual, previous reading. And if you haven't got a theory, why were you doing this? And if you haven't got a theory, go back and read some more. Or go talk to someone who has a different theory and ask them. Yes, sir. Uh, so about correlated residuals. So if I uh, uh, if I do like an M plus or or Levon model, uh, and I uh, I correlate uh, the items with each other, is that the same as cor yeah correlated residuals? That's that's what I'm doing. That's what you're doing. You're saying this factor explains these items, and, and, and what's left these items are correlated with each other. So. Diagrammatically, that would show on the residual. Mm -hmm. So, don't, well, if those two items are correlated and it's not sufficiently explained by the shared covariance captured in the factor, what you're really saying is the mod indices say these two items are so similar that I need to add a correlation to capture this structural covariance matrix. And if there's that similar, one of them's not necessary. Yeah. Not, not all the time, yeah. Well, I would be suspicious. As a reviewer and a, an examiner, I'd be going, oh, no, please, no, 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 no. Well, not a good enough explanation, sir. I'll Go back and redo to, this. To never, uh, to never try to publish anything when you're reviewing if it has uh, scenario-based tests or something with high local dependency. Ah, now, now you're starting to talk about a scenario that might need this technique. But the general attitude surveys that people go randomly at correlating residuals, you'd have to make a case for why this is necessary and why it's legitimate. And you'd have to point to authorities as to why it's legitimate. Maybe your situation 
it is legitimate, but very rarely other... I don't know enough about your situation to know whether it's legitimate or not. Well, if it's true, you should also be able to add another latent factor, and it, it should also work as well. So. You mean like a bifactor model? Yeah. Okay, we're going to get to bifactor models. Uh, here's a Jamovi modification of disease for the residuals. In case you really wanted to know, could I fix something by correlating the residuals? <laughs> and then what you see down here is TI4, TI3, TI5 wants to go with TI4, was back there. And TI3 wants to go with TI2, and TI2 wants to go with TI1. Which means maybe I just have too many items in that set that are too close in meaning. And people are just going, oh, that's the same as that one. So it tells me, go into that TI factor and look at them, and look at the correlations and go, Could, what would happen if I got rid of one with that desire to co-vary the residuals go away. But there's, there's some warning there. Duplicate items in the factor. Ooh, good timing. Estimation problems are quite common with small sample size, poor model specification, over factor constructs. Solutions must fit and be theoretically sound. Remove the factors. Use the modification indices. Try other things. We're going to do this. Remember, can you defend it? Not just say, Barbara Byrne says it's okay. That's not a defense. That's equivalent to going to your oral exam and saying, I did it that way because my supervisor said so. <laughs> That's constant. Really? Oh, Maxine. <laughs> I feel for you because there is nothing more embarrassing than a student saying, I really don't know, my supervisor did that. That's Don't do present research that you don't know how to do, for God's sake. And uh, I actually, we, we like to do mock exams where we prepare people for the real exam. And... Uh, I was given the report and asked to question, and so I said, okay, blah, 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 you did this, so well, why did you do that? And she actually sat there and said, uh, I don't know, my supervisor did that. And I said, stop, you just failed your oral, you just failed your PhD. That answer is unacceptable. Do not ever do that. Find an answer that you can say, oh, we did that because and give a reason, and the answer cannot be my supervisor said so or did it, did it. I don't want you in my club, PhD, if, you, if that's the best you can do. Right? We're an elite club, and we only let in smart people who know what they're doing. Hopefully. <laughs> At least none of my students get into the club without knowing what they're doing. I can't speak for the rest of you. <laughs> well, do you know how many presidents are in our club? In your club? Presidents of what? Of state. I think ours is. Ours has a PhD. I think yours also does. No. No? Jacinda Ardern does not have a PhD. Well, Obama has a PhD, for sure. Yeah, he's not my president, so I don't have to worry about it. He's no one's president right now. Um, Interestingly, in Germany, the Minister of Defense lost his job as Minister of Defense because it was discovered that he had cheated on his PhD. Well, that's nice to hear. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's the merit system at work. Hang on, you lied. Yeah, it's right. A lot of ministers who uh, lost their PhDs, lost yeah. them. <laughs> they even lost them. Lost them. Uh, but we know that PhD is not real. Okay. Well, in that case, you're probably in the same situation as India, where, okay, you have a bachelor's degree, but what university did you go to? Oh, you went to one of those. That's equal to nothing, <laughs> because we know how degrees are got in that kind of university. And so that's why when Elena was talking to me about 
coming here, I went on the internet and went, who's the higher school of economics university? What? And it says, oh, number three in Russia. Okay. Well, that's a promising <laughs> sign. So maybe somebody lied on Wikipedia or something, but it, you know, they, oh. but no, there was a reference to a ranking system, and I'm like, oh, okay, that's, so this is okay. But so. you have never heard before about this university. Well, how much do I know about Russian universities? Maybe you have students from Russia and you know, and you are in the tradition or something. Where in New Zealand? <laughs> I know there, there's a young woman well, what do you in mean about New Zealand? young woman. Yeah, she's a still a young woman. Uh, just finished a uh, PhD, her second PhD at the University of Auckland from Russia. Svetlana, or Lana to her friends, <laughs> not Ina or Irina or Elena. Lana, yeah, much easier. Anyway, um, no, I didn't know much about Russia, so I, what would I know? Uh, I don't know. Is, is, I don't know. No, I have no idea who who would be number one in Russia. But if it was the Novosibirsk State University, man, I might be a little worried. Doubtful. What is what it's technical field? You shouldn't. Okay, if and you say so. And now it's in Siberia, it's warmer than here in Moscow. <laughs> yes, the peach is on fire, yeah. <laughs> Dimitri, can we send them to coffee break? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's 11.30. You closed the door, now can you open it? <laughs>